I'm Margaret Preston, president of Power of Parkinson's, and today, in conjunction with our POP Profile series, we have Dr. Richard Manfredi, instructor in medicine and digestive diseases at Rush University Medical Center. Dr. Manfredi, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks. Great to be with you. Good, good. Well, if you're ready, I'd like to jump into the first set of questions around gut and really the initiation of Parkinson's. Um, as we know, growing experimental evidence, and this is certainly your world, shows that intestinal microbes, a unique set of microorganisms living in all of us, really does have an, an impact on neurological function and health. So share at a high level with our listeners how um, really that causal relationship has presented itself in emerging research. Sure. Well, Margaret, I, I think the connection between, um, you know, microbes and neurologic function is not an obvious one for most people. I mean, it, it makes intuitive sense that our intestinal health affects our central nervous system. Um, but really, the, the mechanisms that explain this connection have really remained elusive. Mm -hmm. Now, when I got into this field, my goal was to figure out sort of from an engineering perspective, how we can prevent proteins from misfolding since um, it's been known for a long time that neurodegeneration is caused by these clumps of misfolded proteins in the brain. So I turned genes on and off to see which molecular pathways could be manipulated to stop protein folding. Mm -hmm. But we ran into substantial roadblocks, um, you know, which is not a surprise in a, a field where there's really no disease modifying therapies, and we're still relying on dopamine replacement drugs right. from the 1960s. Right. So what were we missing? Uh, well, it, it turns out that alpha synuclein, which is the protein that forms these debilitating clumps in Parkinson's patients, may not originate in the brain after all. Mm -hmm. So for over a century, it was believed that Parkinson's disease begins in the brain. Right. But now we have evidence that protein misfolding may begin outside of the brain um, or, me, or you know, maybe even outside of the central nervous system. This idea uh, was first published in 2003 by um, Heiko Brock, who found that these misfolded alpha-synuclein clumps um, are first seen in the gastrointestinal tract and in the olfactory bulb even years before uh, a patient develops motor symptoms. So this may explain to us why many of our patients experience constipation and decreased sense of smell many years before they develop tremor. Right. You know, perhaps the misfolded alpha synuclein traveled from these peripheral organs through the brain via the vagus nerve. Um, and there's lots of animal and human data to support this hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this hypothesis was not taken seriously uh, when it was first published, uh, despite the high quality of the data, um, it, it still resides somewhere outside of the mainstream of science. Um, but it's been gaining traction in recent years, uh, mainly because of an abundance of data in both animals and humans. So this, for us, opened up a vast new set of questions to answer. So if, if Parkinson's disease begins in the gut, then something there is likely to be the trigger. You know, mm -hmm. what causes proteins to misfold? Is there a way we can prevent or slow disease by changing gut brain signals, maybe through like diet or medications? So in order to better serve my patients, I, sh I shifted my focus to answering these questions. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that different people have different intestinal microbes, um, depending on diet, lifestyle, etc. So kind of our working hypothesis is that these microbes have something to do with gut brain signals. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the key to understanding and eventually beating Parkinson's disease lies in changing our microbial makeup mm -hmm. in order to overcome these modifiable risk factors and stop the disease at its source. Right, right. You segued into my next question beautifully. Um, I really enjoyed reading your work because you've taken you're we're almost working backwards, as you've elaborated. You've taken the known factors about Parkinson's, of course, the loss of dopamine due to misfolded proteins, and really going back from there. So by finding that inflammation can cause the proteins to misfold, you're asking what causes the inflammation. So talk to about talk to us about this line of thought as you work backwards, and what are you finding as a reason for the disease-inducing inflammation? Sure. So, so um, you know, one of the most interesting breakthroughs in the field, um, aside from Brock's hypothesis, has been this idea that 
Parkinson's disease has environmental causes. Um, so I, I used to study miners and farmers um, who are more likely to develop symptoms of Parkinsonism um, after exposure to pesticides, um, heavy metals, manganese, uh, industrial chemicals. Um, you recently heard Ray Dorsey discuss these epidemiologic connections, which he writes about in his wonderful book. Um, and as he points out, the number of cases has been rising at an alarming rate. And so we want to know what's accounting for this rate. We, well, we, we know it's probably not genetics because alpha-synuclein mutations are very rare and they're confined to particular families. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that this all can be attributed to industrial-grade toxins either, um, since the number of idiopathic cases that we're seeing far exceeds what we would be expected if there was right. some toxin in the environment. So in, instead, I actually posit that there's something in the diet of Western societies that's causing the signal for the onset of Parkinson's. Um, and, and if you look at any society where Parkinson's is prevalent, we see a dramatic increase in cases after the society undergoes some sort of industrial revolution and, and adopts more of a Western style diet. Um, so James Parkinson first described the disease in the early 19th century when London uh, was undergoing its period of um, intense industrialization. Um, and today you can see a striking increase in places like China and Sub-Saharan Africa that are undergoing periods of rapid industrial growth. So you you, you asked me about inflammation, um, and I think that the rise of industrialization has brought about changes in our diet that may trigger a network of inappropriate immune reactions mm -hmm. that we, we broadly term this to be inflammation. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it's still a matter of debate whether inflammation is a cause or a consequence of protein misfolding. So, I, you know, I don't want you to think that this is the end-all, be-all sort right. of cause. Mm -hmm. um, but it has been shown that inflammatory signals are overproduced in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, and it's maybe these signals that tip the balance in favor of protein misfolding. So now the, the question arises, well, where is this inflammation coming from? You know, by and large, I think the major source of inflammation we see is in the GI tract, uh, where each of us, you know, carries this vast ecosystem of bacteria, fungi, um, archaea, viruses. Um, did you know that there are more than 100 trillion microbes living inside of you? And many of these have to do with diet and these microbes feed on the food that we eat, and they all produce metabolites that can influence a whole variety of biochemical functions, you mm -hmm. know, in including neurological function. And in Parkinson's disease, the microbes are the likely culprit behind disease-causing inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been the shift in our diet that has really allowed this to happen. It's fascinating. Uh, tell us about the how is the gut microbiota of Parkinson's patients really different from those without Parkinson's disease? Sure. Yeah. This, this was a, a major uh, breakthrough in recent years. So we know that we each contain this ecosystem of microbiota that's very complex. Um, and we've known about this ecosystem for quite some time, but you know, only in recent years have we uh, truly been able to understand what it means for health and disease. Mm -hmm. um, and this is in part due to advances in sequencing and computational analysis that I've made it easier to collect and analyze microbiota and their genetic information, which is known as the microbiome. Um, and in the case of Parkinson's disease, the microbiota and it's their interpretation um, have largely been worked out in the lab of, of um, Dr. Ali Keshavarzian, um, who's a real pioneer in this field, and he's actually the principal investigator at Rush. Um, he found that people with Parkinson's disease, on average, have more pro-inflammatory bacteria that are responsible for causing abnormal immune responses. So an overactive immune system can activate harmful signals in the brain um, that may even lead to neurodegeneration or misfolding of proteins. And the walls of the intestine are, even in, in Parkinson's disease, the walls of the intestine are more permeable, uh, mm -hmm. which allows the metabolites of these pro-inflammatory bacteria to escape more easily into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And this concept is known as the leaky gut, um, actually was also pioneered by Dr. Keshavarzian and his group. Uh, but that's not all. We we also found that bacteria um, in the Parkinson's gut do not produce enough neuroprotective signals for the brain. 
So someone without Parkinson's normally eats food, and then the bacteria in the gut produce these metabolites called short-chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. And these short-chain fatty acids then interact with endocrine cells in the intestinal lining. And those cells send hormonal signals to the brain. Now, without these hormonal signals, neurons um, in the movement centers of the brain are more likely to degenerate. Mm -hmm. And so in animals deprived of these hormones, motor symptoms like tremor and imbalance and even forgetfulness and depression are more likely to develop. Mm -hmm. we, we actually recently uh, discovered that people with Parkinson's disease do not produce um, these healthy gut to brain signals. Mm -hmm. And we think it's because they lack the necessary bacteria to produce the short chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. There are other groups that want to restore these signals pharmacologically, but our discovery is powerful because it suggests that the proper signals can be restored through the diet. So that's been our, our major um, area of emphasis. That makes sense. Uh, well, share or highlight some of the symptoms you see as a result of the disrupted gut in Parkinson's patients. Um, and do these really outline and make up some of the preliminary symptoms you noted, you know, t you could see the gut symptoms five, 10 years prior to diagnosis. So are some of these almost at uh, a, a preliminary stage of uh, prior to diagnosis? Sure. Yeah. So, well, what we're finding is that is signaling between the gut and the brain is bidirectional, which mm -hmm. means that the signals from the gut affect neuronal function and signals from the brain affect gut function. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about the cause of Parkinson's disease, the, the jury is still out regarding whether uh, abnormal microbiota represent the, you know, the, the, the chicken or the egg. Um, and despite this, we, we do know that changes in the gut often occur even before the onset of motor symptoms. So our patients often tell us that constipation and decreased sense of smell um, occur years or even decades before their Parkinson's is diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, now, so we, we finally have an explanation for this by applying what we know about the altered microbiota, uh, gut leakiness, inflammation. Um, and in fact, for some people, alpha-synuclein may aggregate in the gut and in the nose long before it reaches the, the brain. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, constipation um, can be a severe symptom that progresses over time. Um, at, at the Rush Medical Center, we have a unique clinic um, that specializes in GI manifestations of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And so constipation is actually our number one complaint um, that severely limits quality of life for our patients with Parkinson's. It's a major source of stress for their families and caregivers. Um, and what we're finding is that constipation stems uh, from two major causes. Uh, number one is slow colonic transit. So just like the rest of the body, the, the colon is slow in Parkinson's disease. Um, and this may cause constipation that's sometimes followed by a rush of diarrhea. And we do have medications to treat this. Some of them are not very good, but we're in the process of uncovering new insights into treatment on almost a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, and the other major cause of constipation that most people don't even realize is weakness of the pelvic floor muscles that allow for defecation. Mm -hmm. And we have a special test to offer our patients to diagnose this problem. Um, and unfortunately, unlike the slow transit problem, there's really no good medical therapy for pelvic floor dysfunction at this time. Um, the best treatment is something called pelvic floor physical therapy, which is performed by a specially trained physical therapist. Um, and then aside from constipation, we frequently see some other problems like difficulty swallowing, um, abdominal pain and bloating, nausea and malnutrition. Uh, we also, in our clinic, we perform procedures to evaluate and treat these conditions. And, you know, we can do things like installing feeding tubes or pumps to deliver medications if necessary. Absolutely. Well, uh, tell us if the diagnosis, I, and I have to backtrack, I asked this question. It's a bit of a loaded question because we all want the answer to be yes, that there's a connection and soon we'll be able to quickly um, alleviate uh, the diagnostic measures and put an end to Parkinson's. And I asked this question, as you know, um, to Dr. Tim Sampson at Emory University. So um, I'd like to ask it to you. We do know the diagnosis of Parkinson's has been largely idiopathic to date. So could studying the intestinal microbes as it relates to the disease start putting some diagnostic parameters that we're all longing for um, at this point? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, that also begs the question, is there a way to um, diagnose Parkinson's at an earlier stage? Um, really, I have to say that as as GI doctors and hepatologists, we're, we're not we're not really in the business of diagnosing Parkinson's disease. So we, we leave that up to the neurologists who have infinitely more expertise with diagnosing movement disorders. Um, and although our work is mainly concerned with treatment and prevention, um, the findings do have some interesting implications for diagnosis. So if Parkinson's be begins in the gut, um, you know, even for a subset of people, then we know that having three or fewer bowel movements a week, typically mm -hmm. known as constipation, may be an early sign of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. and according to our study, um, if we do a colonoscopy on someone with early onset Parkinson's disease, we would expect to find alpha-synuclein aggregates and perhaps um, increased inflammatory markers in the stool. But at the moment, these tests are only done for research purposes, and they're not yet intended for, for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the jury is still out regarding whether they eventually will be part of diagnosis, but I think at this point, um, their primary use is in giving us insight into um, the early manifestations of Parkinson's disease and how it may begin for some people outside of the central nervous system. That makes sense. Um, let us move on to pre and probiotics for Parkinson's. Um, we all know the market is saturated with lots of different options, but let's put it, let's spin it, um, in the Parkinson's world and talk a little bit about the options with these products. Um, especially as, you know, the market does offer so many choices and, um, sometimes offers hope and it might be false hope, but offers hope to people with Parkinson's. So share with us, um, can a person with Parkinson's utilize pre or probiotics really to fix their microbial makeup? Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of patients may think I'll, I'll just, if I have a problem, I can take one of these over the counter medications and change my makeup and my symptoms will be alleviated. So share with us yeah. probably the, the, the falsehood in that or any options that are available. Sure. Well, I, I'm glad you asked that because it's a, it's a question we often get. Um, so probiotics are basically strains of bacteria that are taken orally. And prebiotics are food compounds like fiber that are eaten by certain strains of bacteria once they arrive in your colon. Um, so it, it's natural to think that such a strategy could be used to fix an abnormal gut ecosystem. Mm -hmm. at, at the current time, however, you know, the answer is no. Uh, we do not have a magic bullet to fix the problems associated with microbiota and Parkinson's. And the reason is because each therapy that's on the market targets a different type of bacteria and none are targeted to the specific types of bacteria that are involved in Parkinson's. Um, however, part of the research that we do um, involves identifying prebiotic fibers uh, that increase short chain fatty acid producing bacteria and decrease pro-inflammatory bacteria. So without a specific targeted prebiotic, it's like we're shooting in the dark and there may even be um, some uh, unintended or abnormal consequences to taking um, probiotics. So my next question is certainly similar and tied to this aspect. Um, and you can probably just answer with a simple no, but you think of folks without Parkinson's who want to avoid Parkinson's. So they're thinking maybe I can take XYZ to um, prevent my gut or my makeup, my ecosystem from changing in a harmful way or in a way that affects my neurological function. So talk to us about someone who is seeking to do that. Um, and again, the answer might just be no. Um, well, I, I, you know, actually, that's process. that's a different sort of a different question. You know, th okay. theoretically, yes. Um, our research has shown that um, healthy gut microbiota can prevent the development or progression of motor symptoms in animals, um, mm -hmm. and it may even decrease the toxicity of environmental pollutants. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important area to look into. Can you know someone with early onset disease take a, uh, some sort of prebiotic or probiotic to stave off Parkinson's? Right. However, um, finding the right intervention that targets the right bacteria is difficult, and to date, su no such intervention is available. Mm -hmm. At the moment, um, I would rather recommend a healthy diet and lifestyle for younger people, mm -hmm. since we know that preventing diabetes, high cholesterol, and obesity are independently associated with improved microbiota, um, mm -hmm. and this alone might help stave off Parkinson's disease. 
Absolutely. Well, what advice would you give to people with Parkinson's as it relates to pre and probiotics? Would it, would the just healthy diet apply, also apply to the people who are also di- are already diagnosed? Um, are we at the point in which we can su- suggest certain strands of bacteria um, that would really impact people with Parkinson's disease? Sure. Yeah. So my advice right now would be um, to avoid temptation to buy what's on the market right now. You know, there's so many products being sold to you uh, from probiotic supplements to foods like yogurt that contain bacterial strains. So my advice is to save your money on these brand name products um, because some of them, although some of them may have some legitimacy in IBS, None of them are designed to treat the specific type of dysbiosis in Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So you could think of it like when an ecologist introduces too much of a certain population into the wild. For example, if they put too many wolves into a forest, Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be unintended consequences for um, the animals already living in the the forest. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's the same with your intestines. So if you introduce too much of a certain bacteria that's not targeted to your specific illness, uh, then you run the risk of unintended consequences like right. exacerbating influ- uh, inflammation. So it's a very delicate balance. And for those reasons, I would much favor diet or improving diet at this time. Absolutely. So our next set of questions happen to be around dietary health. Um, share with our listeners what impact their diet has um, really on their ability to manage the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. We know foods is often medicine. So share how they can manage, best mitigate and manage the symptoms of the disease. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the exciting thing is that now that we understand the mechanism of brain communication, we can optimize your diet to improve health. Um, And it's this idea of food as technology or food as medicine as as that has really uh, revolutionized the practice. Now, if you want a comprehensive list of foods, I would recommend speaking with our dietitian. Uh, but in general, our goal is to increase the amount of short chain fatty acid producing bacteria um, and minimize bacteria that make pro inflammatory metabolites. Mm-hmm. That's it. I think those are great one liners folks who are listening can take with them to their neurologist or dietitian and kind of get to your point a listing of food and something that they could put into practice really tomorrow um, and make that change. We'll share um, or list some important components that would make up a healthy diet for those living with Parkinson's disease. So we touched on fiber. What other aspects would be important? Um, yeah, for- this is an, an active area of research now. So the diet that seems to combine all of those mechanistic aspects that we're looking for um, is found in something called the Mediterranean diet, which you may have heard of. Um, so this this is a diet that's rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, also has beans and nuts. Mm -hmm. Um, It can include seafood or or poultry for additional protein, Mm -hmm. uh, but no red meat. Right. Um, The diet is also low in bread, pasta, and other carbohydrates. Um, It's also low in processed food. And this is important since processed meats like sausage and cold cuts tend to increase the so-called bad bacteria in your gut, Mm -hmm. those that produce the pro-inflammatory signals. Um, so Dr. Keshavarzian likes to specify that your produce should be organic um, and you should include olive oil and something called ancient grains, uh, which you can look up. It includes things like millet and sorghum. Um, now, we need to acknowledge, though, that sticking to this type of diet, especially an organic diet, will certainly increase your grocery bill. Right. Uh, personally, I find myself to be a little less restrictive with my patients only because I want them to stick with a healthy diet for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And the last thing we want to do is put someone on a restrictive diet because many of our patients are already malnourished Mm -hmm. and we certainly don't want to exacerbate the problem. So by all means, uh, don't don't be on a very restricted diet. But I would contend that a a Mediterranean diet, you know, really does not need to be overly expensive. Um, You can find most, if not all of those healthy foods in your, your local grocery store. Well, as we wrap up our questions around dietary health um, and speaking about food, um, there's been so much literature and discussion around medication absorption. Um, So thinking about how food impacts the absorption and efficacy of our medications for Parkinson's, share with our listeners um, kind of timing of food, what foods to avoid if there's um, literature and validation in these thoughts. 
Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so um, the interaction of food with medications in Parkinson's is a big topic, um, mm-hmm. but I can comment on the absorption of levodopa, mm-hmm. uh, which for some patients is limited by protein in the diet. Right. So I want to emphasize though, that you may read about the protein effect, but this problem only affects a subset of patients, Mm -hmm. um, typically those in the more advanced stages of the disease. So if you are in the earlier stages of the disease, um, this may not affect you. Mm -hmm. Um, You may find that eating high protein foods um, like meat, dairy, and nuts interferes with your response to levodopa. So Mm -hmm. if you have that issue, you should then space out your protein intake throughout the day um, or alternatively, you can choose to eat protein only at the end of the day. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is nausea is a, is a common side effect of taking levodopa. So if you get nausea with levodopa, you can try to take it with crackers or fruit um, either 30 minutes before or 30 minutes after your dose of medication. But before making any of these changes to your diet, you should consult with your neurologist um, because these recommendations will change depending on which medications you are using. Um, And they'll also change with the frequency that you're taking them. So it depends on how frequently you're taking levodopa, um, how much you should spread out your protein intake, um, or how much time before or after taking medicines you should give um, before eating. Absolutely. Um, Well, as we start to wrap up our discussion um, and thinking about kind of what can happen in the future as we think about therapeutical measures um, that really stem from understanding more about the microbiota, um, if we were to, let's say we jump ahead on the time continuum, what would you deem as success as you move forward with the uh, research on intestinal microbes and neurological disease and its connection? Sure. So, well, so everything we, we've we talked about is very much a work in progress. I mean, this is a very exciting and fast moving area of research, and we still have a, lo- a long way to go, um, but we learn more and more from our patients every day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, patients in the clinic can participate in a number of studies, which can both help them through the disease, but also provide insights that will help millions of other people throughout the world. Um, in one of our studies, we use a, a uh, tissue engineering approach to actually create miniature intestines from endoscopic biopsies that I take. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can test these miniature colons in the lab under a variety of microbial conditions to determine the best treatment approaches. Mm-hmm. Right now, there are several companies that are trying to find drugs that enhance the gut to brain signals. So enhance those um, signaling hormones that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. A popular theme right now is repurposing diabetes medications for this purpose. Mm-hmm. But I would actually go a step further. I think we can accomplish improved gut brain signaling without the use of pharmaceuticals. And the results that we've seen from our experiments have really shown that to be true. Mm-hmm. We saw that dietary approaches can increase short chain fatty acids, and that alone holds much promise. And in the future, I foresee being able to harness the technology of custom designed prebiotic fibers. These are prebiotic fibers that are designed with the Parkinson's patient in mind or the Alzheimer's patient in mind. And we can improve the specific gut bacteria specific to your disease. Mm -hmm. Um, And we can use this approach to give patients dietary supplements that are targeted to a particular disease and that have minimal side effects or off-target effects that are really always going to be there with uh, pharmaceuticals. Absolutely. Well, the future is certainly exciting and bright as you guys navigate this ever-changing world, but it it needs to be, as you noted, with medications being the first line of treatment for over 50 years. I think it's exciting to start thinking about Parkinson's in a different realm and where it stems from and the therapeutics and diagnostics and everything that we can do as we look at it in this different angle. So, uh, Dr. Manfredi, share with our listeners how we can learn more about you and your research at Rush University. Sure. Yeah. So our, our clinic is located at the Rush University Medical Center um, in Chicago, um, but I am interested in expanding to other locations in the next few years. Um, you can set up an appointment by either calling or searching for either the um, Division of Digestive Diseases or the Neurology Department. Um, so Dr. Keshavarzian and I are on the digestive diseases side, mm-hmm. uh, but our visits are con- are um, conducted collaboratively with uh, neurologists. 
Um, so if you want to learn more about our research, you can search for our recent review articles on PubMed, or you can contact our office and we can send you some additional resources. So, you know, that uh, gut brain issues and Parkinson's are often not talked about. So I, I could certainly understand uh, if, if you're not able to find a lot of resources on this. Um, but I think it's important to spread the word because uh, gut brain issues and Parkinson's um, can cause quite a lot of suffering. Um, and we now understand them to be at the core of the disease itself. Yes. So we've almost come full circle in our understanding. So if you're going through this, uh, any GI-related issue, issues with Parkinson's, please remember that you're not alone in going through this. This is a very complex issue and extremely prevalent. Uh, many patients with Parkinson's, um, other synucleinopathy diseases, and other neurodegenerative diseases suffer quite a bit. We're making progress. And as we make progress and continue our research, we're keeping you, the patient, in mind ev really every step of the way. That's a fantastic note to leave on. I appreciate that sentiment. And I can't thank you enough for being part of the series and sharing your world um, to people with Parkinson's. Absolutely. And best of luck with your, your foundation. Thank you.